Hello, and welcome to JAMA Evidence, our podcast series based on core issues in evidence-based medicine. Today, we'll be discussing Bayesian hierarchical modeling. I'm your host, Dr. Roger Lewis, statistical editor for JAMA and co-editor of the JAMA Guide to Statistics and Methods series. I'm here with Dr. Anna McLaughlin. Thank you for joining us, Dr. McLaughlin. If you could go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you for having me. My name is Anna McLaughlin. I'm a statistician. I am director and senior statistical scientist at Berry Consultants, and I've been here for about 11 years. And primarily, my role is in designing and analyzing data from clinical trials and primarily focusing on adaptive clinical trials, many of which use Bayesian methodology. So today we're going to talk about a particular kind of statistical modeling that really points out a general challenge that we have when we're thinking about the treatment effects in different groups of patients. So what I'd like to do is start by talking about the general problem we're trying to solve before we talk about how it is we can go ahead and actually solve it. When we observe data from different groups, there's this interesting phenomenon that happens that the data we observe is more variable or more spread out than the truth. So we can see this in an example that we talk about in the paper where we suppose that we have four experiments, four groups of patients. And for each of these groups, we're going to observe 100 patients and look at their response on a certain outcome. So if Mother Nature tells us that the true response rate in these four groups is 60%, what will happen when we actually observe the data in these four groups? We aren't going to observe exactly 60% in each one of these four groups. We're not going to see 60 out of 100 in each of the four groups. We might expect that some of the groups might observe a lower rate, 58%. Some of them are going to observe a higher rate, 63, 65%. So what that means is that the data we've observed in the four groups is more spread out than what we know to be the truth. So how does that affect the way we look at treatment effects in subgroups where we can't possibly know that they really have the same treatment effect and they might be different. Yeah, that's an important point because, of course, we don't usually, we don't ever really know the truth. But if we recognize this phenomenon, we recognize that the data we observe is going to be more spread out, that's just due to random variability, then when we think about how to estimate the true response rate in these four groups, we should not just naively take the observed data in each group, but we should recognize that that observed data is more spread out than it should be. So when we're thinking about how to estimate the truth, we actually want to think about shrinking those estimates towards each other. So instead of just using the data individually from those four groups, we can have a better estimate by recognizing that the true estimate should be closer together than what we observe. So in a trial that's looking at an experimental treatment versus a standard of care, for example, those estimates might be the apparent treatment effect, how beneficial the experimental treatment is in each of the four subgroups. And these four subgroups could differ by underlying illness severity or some other characteristic. So what we commonly see in clinical trial reports is that those treatment estimates are just given for each of the four subgroups. Does that mean that those estimates are, are biased in some way or not the best estimates? So when we look at those estimates with this recognition that observed data will tend to be more spread out than the truth, we should think about those estimates as being a little bit biased. And we could have a better estimator if we could have a model that recognizes that inherent variability in the randomness and can produce estimates that are closer together and that have a better estimate of the variability across the subgroups. 
Once we realize that the treatment effects in different subgroups likely exaggerate how different the treatments are from each other across the subgroups, how does that make us think about the outliers, those subgroups that seem to have a particularly large treatment effect or a particularly small treatment effect? When we view that observed data from different subgroups, we should recognize that when we see an outlier that is smaller than the other subgroups, we should recognize that it is likely underestimating the treatment effect in that subgroup. And when we see an outlier in the other direction with a a very large estimated treatment effect, we should recognize that that's likely an overestimate of the true treatment effect. Because we see this, we recognize that there is this variability, this over variability. Uh, So by using a model that recognizes that the observed data is more spread out than the truth, we can have a better estimate that is closer to the truth than if we just analyze each of those subgroups separately. And when you say better, what do you mean by better? So what we mean by better is that the estimate is closer to the truth and that it has less uncertainty than if we were to estimate each of the effects separately. So now that we've talked about this challenge, that just looking at the individual data from subgroups or individual patients leads to an overestimate of how different they are from each other. Let's talk about the solution. And the solution you discuss in your paper is a Bayesian hierarchical model. So I want to pull apart the different pieces of that phrase. So we'll do them in order. So tell us a little bit about what Bayesian means in this context. The statistical analyses that many of us are used to seeing results in a p-value. And those are traditional statistics methods. What a Bayesian analysis is going to do is allow us to use not only the data that we've observed in our trial or our experiment, but also formally incorporate data from another source. This could be data external to the trial, for example, and to formally synthesize that information along with the new information that we learn in the trial. So Bayesian statistics allow us to continually update what we're learning. Take our prior information that we know before we do the experiment, we formally synthesize that information with what we learned during the experiment, and then we can produce new estimates based on both of those sources of information. So if we're using Bayesian approaches to estimate treatment effects, then the next question is, what does it mean to have a hierarchical model? What is the hierarchy and why do we need that? A hierarchical model recognizes that the data that we are collecting has a structure to it and that the observed data points naturally are grouped together in some way. So in a clinical trial, this could be, for example, that The patients may naturally be grouped together within their site or their country or by some other patient characteristics about their disease. So let's talk a little bit about the example that was the motivation for the article that you wrote. So tell us a little bit about the study that involved this rare disease and why it was so important to think about the different levels in the hierarchy. In this study, the investigators are enrolling a limited number of patients and trying to make the most use out of the limited patient resources that they have. So they conduct a series of N of 1 experiments where each patient is exposed to both the treatment and the placebo. And each time they are exposed to this set, uh, treatment and placebo, the order is randomized. And each patient may receive multiple sets where they are alternately exposed to treatment and placebo. So in this example, the data that we observed is naturally grouped together. For example, we have data that's grouped together within each patient. Another important aspect of the study is that patients were characterized by their subtype of the disease. So not only are the data points grouped by patients, 
but there's also a natural grouping by the subgroup. So to summarize, in this example with a rare disease, we obtained response scores from patients as they transitioned from one treatment to another. And those responses over time were grouped within the patient. Then the patients were grouped within the two possible genetic subtypes of the disease. And then, of course, there's the top level group where all the patients are put together. So talk about what the hierarchical model allows us to say regarding the treatment effects at each level of the hierarchy. The hierarchical model allows us to estimate the treatment effects at each one of those levels. So we get an estimate of the treatment effect within each patient. We get an estimate of the treatment effect within each of the two disease subgroups. And we get an estimate of the overall treatment effect across the groups. So now let's return to this concept of shrinkage. So if we had not used a hierarchical model, where would we have gone wrong? Where would we have overestimated the variability um, in those treatment effects? If we had not used a Bayesian hierarchical model, the risk that we run is that we would overestimate the variability in the true underlying responses. So as we discussed earlier, we have this phenomenon that when we observe data from multiple groups, it is more spread out than the truth is. So in this particular example, at one level of the hierarchy, we have the two disease subgroups. And what the hierarchical model does is it tends to shrink the estimate of the treatment effect from those two subgroups closer together, recognizing that the observed data is more spread out than the truth. And then at the lower level of the hierarchy, we have that same thing that happens. So if we just looked at the individual data and the treatment effects per patient, those observed data are likely more variable and more spread out in the treatment effects than the truth. So without the hierarchical model, we would overestimate how different patients are from each other, and we would tend to overestimate how different the different genetic types of disease are from each other with respect to the treatment response. Is that right? That's right. So, Anna, if this challenge in interpreting different groups of patients, whether they're individual patients or subgroups in a clinical trial, is such a common challenge, and the simplest approach of just looking at the data within each subgroup or patient separately predictably gets us the wrong answer, or at least a less accurate answer, Why do you think hierarchical models aren't used more often? Right. So as you said, the simplest way to look at subgroups is to look at them individually. It's the most natural way to think about it. And it seems a little counterintuitive that we can get better estimates in a subgroup by looking at data in other subgroups. But that's why these methods are important, because they recognize that the counterintuitive answer is actually the right one. That when we recognize there is information that can be beneficial in the other subgroups, we actually get better estimates for each of our individual subgroups. So what is it that the model is learning by looking at all the subgroups together? The model is learning and helping us understand the true variability across the subgroups. And that's a piece of information that we don't get if we just look at them individually. And then what does the model do with that information? When we recognize that there's this variability across subgroups and we learn how much of that variability is just expected versus how much of that is truly different, the model learns how much it should shrink the estimates of our treatment effect closer together versus leaving them more spread out. I'm Roger Lewis, and we've been speaking about Bayesian hierarchical models with Dr. Anna McLaughlin. You can find a link to the paper in this episode's description. This episode was produced by Daniel Masisi 
at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.